Welcome to the Unapologetic Woman podcast, where we champion the stories of bold women making their mark. I'm Al Marsh, your host on a journey of re-empowerment. Today, we're joined by Meredith Rhodes, an extraordinary Thrive Digital Business Advisor, honored with multiple President's Club Awards and dedicated to guiding small and medium-sized businesses for over 18 years. Together, we're diving into the essence of empowerment, aligning actions with values, reshaping perceptions in business, and embracing the unapologetic path. So, join us for an inspiring conversation on redefining safe spaces, unapologetic values, and fulfillment in business right here on the Unapologetic Women podcast. So, Meredith, darling. I'm so excited to have this conversation with you because you're one of those women that I met and I was just like, ooh, I like the vibe, I like the fire, I like the passion, I love the hustle, I love the conviction, I love the everything about you. Um, and so yeah. I'm so delighted when you said yes to the podcast. And so I wanted to say thank you very much to being probably one of the final guests of the Unapologetic Women podcast. Exciting. Exciting. Thank you. How did we meet again? Who introduced us? Oh my God. Who introduced us? Is it Arliss? Arliss. Shout out to Arliss Ar for making epic connections. And shout out to all the women who continue to make connections. If there's one thing that I've learned in the past two years, it's the power of what happens when women make introductions to other women. I have never experienced anything like this before in my life, but truly the last two years, every single woman that I have met has been introduced by another woman. And then she introduces me to another woman. And I think often, maybe I'll speak for myself. I had a story that women um, weren't very helpful, that women weren't very forthcoming weren't very giving my experience was always that men were extraordinarily supportive especially to a businesswoman more so than other women but these last two years has really blown that story out of the water for me and so my feeling for any woman who's listening in today if you have a story that says that women are unsupportive in business that women are maybe shy in business or you know competitive in business damn girlfriend it's time to change that story because you will be blown away by the amazing woman in this world so let me ask you the question of all questions that we have been asking for two years now what does it mean to you to be an unapologetic woman okay wow um yeah so to be an unapologetic woman is just you know know your truth stand by what you believe in um you know, to, if, if you believe in what you're doing, that should be enough. You know, if you don't believe in something, then you shouldn't be doing it. Whatever that thing is, you shouldn't be doing it because you don't want to let somebody down or, you know, you feel like you should just do it because that's what society thinks or whatever, but you need to be, your actions should be congruent with your beliefs and your, um, your, um, values. So, and don't apologize for that because, you know, you believe in what you're doing and you're doing something that you think is good and helpful and a positive impact, um, then don't apologize for it. So there's two things that you're saying in there that, that I want to maybe delve a little bit deeper in, because for me, everything is a journey. And so it's so easy sometimes I find when we're standing in our journey and go, Yes, you know, we should live with integrity. You should always um, go for what you believe in. You should always adhere to your values. But it's been my experience. Most people don't know what their values are. Most people don't take the time to question that. So most people don't take the time to align what they're going after with their actual values. And it's that out of integrity that has themselves sabotaging a lot of the time without them understanding why. Why am I not going after this thing that I think I should be going after? What is happening here? Can you explain to me or just maybe share with us a little bit about your journey and discovering your values 
and then aligning your life with those values to be this powerhouse woman that we see today? Uh, yeah, I, I think um, if I understand what you're asking, um, I feel like sometimes people are very unhappy with what they do for a career, for example, because, you know, maybe it's to get a paycheck and that is important, but it's not fulfilling. It's not aligning with their values, meaning if they don't feel good at the end of the day, like they've done something good or they're helping in any way. So I think maybe instead of saying values, maybe to say like, um, that they don't feel fulfilled. If you don't feel fulfilled or like you're contributing, um, you know, so much of our time is spent working. We should at least be feeling fulfilled. And I guess some to your point, people may not even know 100% what their values are, but they know at the end of the day how they feel. Like, do they feel good about their day or do they feel like, oh God, you know, it was not a good day. Like it's just another day and like, you know, it's a paycheck. So and maybe people might get confused and that might be why people don't know what their values are because they might just be like, okay, it's just another day, another paycheck. So I think that so much of our lives are spent working and, and even not just work, like everything we do and what we say should ultimately align with what makes us feel good or feel like we're contributing in a positive way and not just shuffling around going through the motions because life is too short. Yeah. Do you ever find yourself in a place or have you in the past where you were, oh my God, this is just a paycheck. Like I'm not getting anything out of this anymore. That's so funny. So the ironic part about that question that you asked me is that I've actually worked in the same job um, since 1996. Um this has been my only career except for some time off I had to raise kids. So the only time I felt like it was a paycheck, obviously was like the first job, like retail and just, you know, um, you know, you kind of can make the best of wherever you are, but you know, I've worked at clothing department stores, shoe stores, I've done, you know, retail kind of stuff. And it's hardly fulfilling, although you can make the most out of any place you are. Um, but, but yeah, so, I mean, but this job, this career, you know what? I, it's funny because I've always loved what I do because of what I do. But I do think that managers have a big part of it. Like you, the, your manager can make this, the same job I've been in for millions and million years since the dinosaurs were roaming. I've been doing this job, I feel. But the ma I've had different managers along the way. And, and, and my happiness really does based on the manager, it does change. It does energize me. So I have an amazing manager now for the last like six years. It just, she's incredible. And if she retires, I'll just follow her and pull her out of retirement. And that'll be that. So, but I've had times at this job with when you have a manager that's micromanaging or that isn't, you know, you know, that, that negative cloud over you, it's hard. That makes your job harder. Even if everything does line up and you have a great job and you love what you're doing and you love your, your product you're selling your customers I think the manager can be an issue too which is tough so so this is interesting because we have a lot of female leaders listening to this podcast mm -hmm. I would love your perspective in your experience of what makes that brilliant manager leader that brings out the best of you as a high performance woman and what are some of the characteristics of the managers that you felt stifled your potential within your position? Okay, great, great question. Because I've been a top performer in my job for the entire time I've been here. I've never not been a top performer. I've always been the top, if not the top two, the top, you know, the top five, 10 in my whole region, hundreds of people. And it it, it does my, my level of enjoyment and fulfillment of it, it, it 100% it's whether or not there's like this big weight on me and I'm not happy. And then it does, it does affect my performance too. So ironically, I haven't even thought about this, but I believe no offense to men, but the bad managers I've had have been men. Wow. <laughs> George, Mark, yeah, not good. Like there've been men and it's just, just by coincidence, um, coincidentally, um, but you know, amazing men. I've had it have been women, but um, the biggest difference between like Elisa and somebody else. So um, a good manager 
actually manages people differently. Mm -hmm. Somebody like myself, that is a hard worker. I am my own, like, I don't need micromanaging. I need, you know, you need to know what motivates me. It's not money. Um, it's being left alone. It's being, you know, trusted and being, you know, all these other things. So, you know, and then there's other managers, a, a, a poor manager or a manager that might need lots of coaching would be somebody that just blanketly manages everybody the same mm -hmm. um, and just doesn't get to know the person or what their strengths and weaknesses are. And also micromanaging is very demotivating. And there are some people that need micromanaging, but that's when you, the good and the, the not so good managers um, come to play because you take somebody like myself and there's other top performers as well. Micromanaging does not work. It demotivates. Um, whereas there's other people that need it. They don't have that kind of, especially now that there's so many bosses that have to work remotely. Not everybody's coming to an office and, you know, okay, you have to trust that they're doing the right thing. They're not really punching a card so much anymore or being checked on. So, you know, it's a challenge for these managers, of course, because they have to, you know, how much, you know, leeway do you give, but you also need to make sure that they're not just like, you know, eating the proverbial bonbons on the couch and watching, you know, soap operas, are they actually working? So it's that it's tough. That's why I'm not a manager and I would never want to be one because I do not, I think it's a very tough position, but I do think it takes a certain skill set. So my phenomenal manager I have now has a skill set in that, like I said, she manages me extremely different than she might manage somebody else on my team. And then that other person very differently too. And she's able to manage to our strengths and to our weaknesses and, and treat us like individuals mm -hmm. that takes time and it does take skill. And I don't think everybody could do it. So, um, but when you can do it, it makes such a big difference. And, and, and if you're a manager right now and your team is not motivated and they don't seem happy, I think that could be the micromanaging and maybe taking a step back to really see how each one ticks and getting to know them and adjusting your management style to that person, you'll, you'll see a better output. Brilliant. And I want to flip the shoe on the other side now, right? Because now we've given the leader something, but there's something else that I really feel is important to highlight here. So often we use our environment as the reason, aka excuse, for our performance or lack of performance. Yet, even though your managers have been both great and not so great throughout the years, your results consistently was that of a top performer. Let's talk a little bit into okay. that. What, mm -hmm. what is the story that's going in your head when you have a not ideal manager that does mm -hmm. not knock you off the high performer log? It's hard. It's been a while um, since that's happened. I don't even want to like think back to that because it's so hard because it's like you have, it's like you're running with, you know, lead on you, you know, it's like they're weighing you down. It just it's so much more exhausting. Um, and my performance did suffer. Um, so I actually should be real about this and true to myself too. My, my, my performance was not as good with the negative management and with micromanaging actually, as it was without that, although I was always very good, it definitely did suffer because it's hard because you're, you have that extra weight on you. That's just dragging you down. And it's hard to, especially if you're in any kind of a sales job where you have to, you know, it, it's that, that does make it tougher. So my results did, were sacrificed at those times. Like I didn't do, I wasn't the highest achieving that I, I could be. Whereas immediately when management changed, that's when, I mean, it's been like this, I think for the last like eight, nine years. Um, So it's just been so phenomenal that it seems like forever, but there, I, back in those times when I had the two managers that I can think of that were very micromanaging, very not a uh, very negative to everybody. Um, yeah. And none of our performance was what it is, what it could be. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's hard. I mean, I I'm very self-motivated, so you push through it, but you're like pushing through, but it's like thick. It's like very, it's exhausting. Yeah. I think that's been one of my, my blessings in this lifetime is, um, like you, I, I don't keep quiet and I've never kept mm -hmm. quiet. So I had quite a career in corporate and I remember my very first job was in banking. Um, 
And I had no issue within the first three months, I walked into the CEO's office and had a conversation with him and he nicknamed me Cheeky. This is like, no 18 year old does this. No 18 year old walks into the CEO of an international bank, plonks herself down and go, I think we need to talk because there's some things here. Um, and throughout the years, whenever I was in corporate, when, when people started micromanaging me, I would have the conversations and go, honey, you know, I understand where you're coming from, but this is not the way. So let's have a little experiment. You stop managing me and you let me do my thing and you look at my results. If right. my results are not fabulous, I will play your game. But right. if my results surpasses the team's results, then you let me right. be. And that's it. That's the carrot. That's the carrot for me. Like it's right? like some people it's money. So for me, it's just leaving me alone. That's it. That's all I want. Just leave me alone and I will perform for you. You'll see the results because I'm self-motivated and that's it. And then the moment that, like you said, the moment that I, that didn't work, if you didn't see the results and I need micromanagement, then that's my issue. Absolutely. Which is probably why I am an entrepreneur by nature, because what would happen is I would outperform the team and then the team doesn't really like you. Um, especially we are talking here in my 20s, right? My 20s and my yeah. early 30s. And so hmm, competition is still rife at that time in your life. Now I'm older, I kind of do things differently. And I also realize this is why I need to be an entrepreneur, because I need to have that complete freedom. But what I'm loving in what you are saying, and I think that this is important for women to hear at this time as well, because corporate has been made such a, like a swear word almost at the moment. Every every woman is being encouraged to be an entrepreneur, and it's painted that this is the road to freedom, which is absolute BS, by the way. Not everybody is born to be an entrepreneur. This is not freedom in the way that people think it is. And you can create that sense of freedom and and your fulfillment within a job. And that's what I'm hearing you say, is you have yeah. created that for yourself in your space. Which, right. Is that correct? Oh, yes, exactly. Yeah. I mean, I, I have the most respect for people who run their own business. I just, it's not for me. So, and it's not for everybody. And I think it's really important for women to start hearing this because I'm tired of us shaming ourselves and each other because we are not allowing ourselves to play into our natural talents, in our natural spaces, in our natural places. Corporate is critical for society. And, and I just feel like we need more women like you in corporate that kind of go, no, 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 I'm here feeling fulfilled, making an impact, living my legacy and rocking it all at the same day so and also the other thing to say to to say to that sorry is also um you know people have asked me too like you know about getting promoted oh my god you're still here like you know what just you know people sometimes want to get promoted but it's not the right fit so being your own being in sales or marketing is a very different job description than managing people yeah. it, one is working with customers the other one's managing and two different skill sets so you know, you need to just not always climbing the ladder is great for a lot of people, but it may not be your path. And so that you can just be successful where you are, which is my choice. That's just how I've chosen to be. Damn, I love this conversation because we are literally <laughs> blowing all the stories out of the water here, right? Because, and I was raised with the mentality that in this life for you to be successful, you have to climb the corporate ladder. You have to get all the education, the, you know, the certificates, the diplomas, the degrees. Then you have to go into corporate and you have to climb the ladder to the top. And what you're saying is, I can't be screwed with the top of the ladder because I love it where I am. Right. How did you bust that? conditioning that programming of no no I like where I am I mean I, I think it's also partly just who I am that I'm clearly like what I what I'm doing I don't I'm not a huge fan of change and I'm super successful at what I'm doing so I just love it so I just I really it's it's simple for me and I know that managing is a skill set that I don't think I have so just because it's the next step you know I was promoted 
within my own you know sales like you know if you get a certain amount of uh if you do well and you get this this indice then you get a, a bump in your salary and you get a different title that's great but i'm always going to stay within my skill set because i know where my skills are and i know where they're not so just because it might be a, a title change that may not be the answer for people. You can just be super successful in the position you're in. And I know that's different. Different people is different, right? So in some cases, promotions make a lot of sense, right? But in sales type jobs, you know, you have to really think, is getting promoted the right thing and managing people over selling and over communicating with the clients themselves, you know? And then that's the conversation you need to really have and really be truthful to yourself about. Then let me ask you this one. What, how do you feel about the mantra that we have to be uncomfortable every day in order for us to become successful? Because when I'm listening to you, it's like, no, no, I don't have to be uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. I get to choose what I'm really bloody good at. And I get to excel yeah. at that every single day and build on the wins. Yeah, that that's it. That's the latter. So I clearly... I mean, I don't like to be super uncomfortable, clearly, or I would be changing jobs all the time. That I'd be trying to, but I'm always dealing with different businesses. I know we never discussed what I even do, but um, what I do involves dealing with all different kinds of businesses. And it, so it's always different, even though it's the same, it's always different. And I meet so many different people from all over um, and different kinds of businesses that I can help. So I feel like it's different and challenges me in different ways in Mustang in my comfort zone, I guess. So yeah, I don't fit the first part of that. Thank you for being an example and the evidence of that, because I've been saying for a long time, but what if that is not true? What if we don't have to be uncomfortable all the time? What if we don't have to do uncomfortable things in order for us to feel fulfilled, in order for us to self-actualize, in order for us to grow, in order for us to be successful? I don't believe in that anymore because I believe the idea that we have to feel uncomfortable in order for us to grow is fear-based. I believe that when we say that we have to set goals that scare us, that's fear-based. Why, why is humanity so stuck on fear when we can, in fact, choose to thrive? <laughs> see what I did there? See, By the way, good. just look at behind Mer Meredith and you'll see thrive behind yeah. there. Um and, and Thrive doesn't need discomfort. Thrive is that, oh my God, I'm doing extraordinary well and I do better and better and better at this without feeling like I have to vomit because my goals are so big or because right. I'm constantly in environments where I feel uncomfortable. What a screwed up philosophy that we've right. all been conditioned with when most people don't enjoy discomfort. So the very thing that we are preached that we have to do is the very thing that actually keep people stuck. Why do you want yeah. to be comfortable all the time? It's it's lunacy to say the least. Yeah, I, I don't, so I agree. So if anybody wants to see an example of what it looks like to thrive, Meredith Rhodes, connect with her, follow her, see what she's up to see how she does it like this is so refreshing and thank you so much this is really really cool so i want to ask you next what do you take an unapologetic stance for in this world oh my goodness um i should have prepared these i'm good if we talk about what i do for a living i can do that like easily um but let's see this uh what do i take an unapologetic stance for i think the things I believe in I mean like I said in the beginning I guess it's just like my values and what I feel um I don't apologize for speaking my mind because that's just my opinion I feel strongly about certain things um you know there's things I don't apologize for I'm very strong about women's rights I like and I don't really care if party or no party like that like I'm very pro women's rights I'm pro you know, gay rights and like all that other stuff. But I also have very strong opinions on other sides too. So like, I don't apologize for that because I feel like, you know, your beliefs are your beliefs and they are important to you and they, they stem from your values. So. 
Wouldn't it be nice if people would actually start understanding that we all get to have our own personal preferences in this lifetime? When we say that we all get to have our own personal preferences, our own values, that means that we allow others to have theirs too. We don't have to agree with them. We don't have to um, support them if it's in contradiction with our own, but we also don't want to change them. Like they don't have to change their opinions, their values for me. I can appreciate the diversity and hold my own. Right. And, and for me, this is where an appreciation of diversity okay. is being lost at the moment. And I see it because people are afraid. They, they either think that we are being threatened by the people who are different from us. And so, oh my God, the world is too small for all of us, apparently. Although, I don't know, when I drive around, I see lots of open space. Like There's a lot of open space on this planet, people. Not even just the water, like on the land. Um, and, and I don't have to change their minds either. They get to have their own life experience. And so, yes, I believe that we all get to have unapologetic values, unapologetic preferences for ourselves, and unapologetic opinions. Let's start appreciating and respecting that. Looking at our time together, what is it that you really want our listeners to take away from this conversation today? Um, yeah, just, I guess, that um, that really... They should re really, it's very important that the women that are listening to this don't just go through the motions and work um, and just get a paycheck. There's so many options out there for them. Um, find something that you believe in. For me, it's helping small businesses um, because, you know, helping those people that are struggling and doing everything on their own and don't need to and um, being able to take so much off their shoulders. It's just, that's super rewarding for me. And it's always been, and it makes me feel really good at the end of the day. If you're spending a lot of your time working and you don't feel good about what you're doing, or you feel unfulfilled, or you know what, maybe you're working for a company that doesn't appreciate you or whatever, life is too short. Um, you definitely need to take it seriously that, you know, the right place. And it may not be moving up the ladder. It might be, it might not be. It might be leaving that job and finding something more fulfilling, or it might be taking the job that you have and changing something to make it better. But what isn't acceptable, what I guess I want people to take away is, you know, you don't want to look back at your life and be like, God, I wasted so much time doing something. And like, you know, at the end of the day is what you're doing and putting your energy in, you know, fulfilling you, is it lining up with your goals and values and morals and and if you need to ask that to yourself, and if the answer is no, there's so much out there. And, you know, don't don't underestimate yourself. There is a little thing I want to dive into before we end today's show. And that is because you work in sales, which for most women has so many negative connotations. <laughs> Most women shy away from sales. They either think that it's dirty or it's hard <laughs> or it's, you know, whatever the story is. I would love your take on sales because you're one of the most passionate salespeople that I've come across in a really long time. How do you mm -hmm. do sales? It's funny because I actually, uh, it's funny. My vice president knows this too, the vice president of the company and my boss. I don't cold call. And I don't sell. And I actually don't make phone calls. I don't do any of these things. Um, I don't leave my house, really. I don't do cold calling in any way, shape, or form. I've been doing this for a long time. So it's all relationships and networking. So it's fun. So it's not selling. So even though it's sales, you know, if you do a good job at whatever your chosen career is, you know, networking and the word will get out and then it just becomes fun and, and it becomes easier. It's like in the beginning, yes, you got to put in your time. And in the beginning, you know, it's going to be a little bit nose to the grindstone and like hard work. But once you've been in your job for a while and you do the right things, you know, your word of mouth will take over networking. So yeah, it's, I don't, I mean, I know it is kind of sales, I guess, but I don't sell. So like if, like, for example, if somebody doesn't need the software or they need something that I don't provide, or it's a square peg in a round hole, 
because of all my networking, I have lots of people I can refer them to. And I will, you know, I don't really care about making a sale because it's not my motivation. My motivation is helping these businesses. So it just, it all works out and it goes around. What goes around comes around always. So what I'm hearing you say is that you don't sell, you help businesses. And that's it. if the system that you represent is what will help the business, then it's a conversation of, well, here is something that will help you to the next level. And if that right. system is not the thing that will take them to the next level, it's like, but here is what will, and this is who exactly. does it. So it's so me interviewing them as much as them interviewing me, because we do have lots of different things. Like we can help automate their, their um, manual tasks. I can help get them online. I can help with leads. We can help with reviews. But if like, if they need just one thing, you know, I mean, our social media is insane. It's about to get even crazier what we're offering. But like, if they just want that, like that, then they need a social media agency and I can refer them to that. I'm not going to stick around peg in a, in a square hole. It's just not worth the energy or aggravation on either of our parts. So it's, it, that's why I think it's not really sales. It's more just like conversation and just, it's just, it's very different. Or, or. Have you reframed sales in your own mind that for you, sales is representing help? Sales is the conversation in which I get to understand what it is that you need and how I can help you to fulfill that need. Society calls yeah. it sale. You have actually redefined it in your mind that this is me actually giving a shit about people's businesses. And yes. how do I get more businesses to succeed in this world? Yes. And I actually want to say something about that, because that point is something I hear as a pushback from clients who part of what we do is help them with marketing, right? And help them with like email marketing, text marketing, getting on social media. I will hear from clients. Oh, I don't want to be salesy. I don't want to be pushy. I don't want to be, you know, um, like, and it's how you frame it. If you're thinking that you're being pushy, no, framing the fact that you've got this great service you want to let people know about. It's all how you frame things in your mind and, and how you see it. And you have to actually believe it. I believe, I mean, as a person I am, I can never say something I don't believe in ever. I've got no poker face and I can't act or anything, but like, as long as that person believes in what they're doing and that they have a great offering, I get this pushback a lot where people are like, oh, I, I don't want to bother people with an email marketing or I don't want to, but if you frame it in your mind as, listen, I'm going to offer this special for the holiday, you know, or, or, you know, I'm giving them something of value, then you're not intrusive. You're offering a value service. So if you think, oh, I'm selling, I'm a salesperson, I'm selling something, then that's, then that's self, then that's a selfish thing. Then you're thinking selfishly of what, what you need, but you need to just be thinking about what your consumers need. What do your customers need? Are you, are you helping them? So my own customers, I have to help them refrain in their own minds that they're thinking that they're bothering people but they're if if they have a service that that's helpful they have to realize that that's all that they're doing is sharing them yeah absolutely you know I've reframed it for myself a long time that I'm partners in success it's not even my my customers it's my partners it's people that I'm partnering with because mm -hmm. I believe that when we work together we can create greater success in the world we can create new dynasties we can create better legacies and how how derelict would I be if I didn't offer my gifts, what I have that nobody else has to my partners, who, by the way, are all my friends, right? So I've, <laughs> all my partners are friends. Some of my friends are my clients. All my clients are friends because yeah. I absolutely adore them. And when you start understanding that, if you were approaching somebody and they were your best friend and you knew that you had something that would support them in their success, why wouldn't you offer it to them? Like, why? Yeah. Right. And if you feel like you're not helpful with what you're doing and that what you, what you offer is not going to be helpful to people, then you're doing the wrong thing. I need to get the hell out and do something else. Thank you. Let's be honest with ourselves. If you do not believe in what it is that you're offering, get the hell out of Dodge and go get out. And do something else. Mm -hmm. Do something else. Yes. If you have the mindset, that you don't want to sell this to your best friend, what you are selling, if you're in sales or you don't think that your product or service is going to help that best friend, you are in the wrong business. Love that. Love that.
I think that's the place to end because it's the place of honesty. It's a place of where we get to be honest with ourselves again. And we're either backing ourselves and aligning with what we truly believe or we don't. What else is there yeah. after that? Meredith, who are you interested in meeting? So who would you like to have conversations with and where do they connect with you? Okay, thanks for asking that. So um, I am in the United States. so. As long as they're in somewhere in the United States, I can connect with them. So I don't know if that limits a lot of people, but um, but service-based businesses, um, new businesses, businesses that are looking to grow, businesses that are overwhelmed and they just want to automate their manual tasks. Um, ideally, any kind of trades people, attorneys, um, bookkeepers, accountants, health and wellness space. Um, those types of service-based businesses um, are really great for me because they need a lot of help with things that we do everything in one. And the best way to connect with me is, um, I don't know if I, the best, if I should give, but my, my email is meredith.roads at thrive.com, which is M-E-R-E-D-I-T-H dot R-H-O-A-D-E-S at thrive, which is spelled thryv.com um and that's probably the best way and my, my number um they can text me at 914-263-4158 um but yeah i'd be happy to speak to anybody that would need help with something awesome darling this has been an amazing conversation thank you again for coming on today um and yes to our listeners thank you so much for tuning in i hope that you are taking away from this the importance of integrity with your values if you truly are passionate about having a fulfilling life every single day um, and with that i'm going to remind you that we get to live our legacies unleashed unlimited and unapologetic have an amazing day further cheers Thank you for joining us on another empowering episode of the Unapologetic Woman podcast. We hope you found this conversation as inspiring as we did. Remember, embracing your strength and authenticity is a journey worth taking and we're thrilled to be part of it with you. If you've enjoyed our discussions and found value in the stories we share, we have a favor to ask. Your support means the world to us. And there are a couple of simple ways you can make a big difference. First, take a moment to leave a review on your favorite podcast platform. Your words have the power to reach other incredible women like you who are seeking upliftment and insight. By leaving a review, you're helping us create a ripple effect of empowerment that extends far beyond these virtual airwaves. Second, think of the remarkable women in your life who would resonate with our message. Share this podcast with them, whether it's a friend, a family member, a colleague, or even a fellow pioneer you've connected with. Together, we can create a community of unapologetic women who uplift, support, and inspire each other. Stay connected with us on social media at The Unapologetic Women for updates, behind-the-scenes moments, and engaging conversations. We love hearing from you and building this vibrant community together. As we wrap up this episode, remember that your journey matters, your voice is vital, and your impact is immeasurable. Let's continue rewriting the narrative and embracing our unapologetic selves one episode at a time. Thank you for being part of the Unapologetic Women movement. Until next time, stay true to yourself, stay unapologetic, and keep dancing to your own tune.